I want you to go through the whole Qur'an with me. Join me at bayna.tv Alhamdulillah Alhamdulillahi khaliq al-wujudi min al-adam wa ja'il al-nuri min al-zulam wa mukhrij al-sabri min al-alam fa mulqi al-tawbati ala al-nadam fa nashkuruhu ala al-masaibi kama nashkuruhu ala al-ni'am wa nusalli ala rasulihi al-akram dhi sharaf al-ashammi wa al-nuri al-atam wa al-kitab al-muhkam وكمال النبيين والخاتم سيد ولد آدم الذي بشر به عيسى بن مريم ودعا لبعثته إبراهيم عليه السلام حين كان يرفع قواعد بيت الله المحرم فصلى الله عليه وسلم وعلى أتباعه خير الأمم الذين بارك الله بهم كافة الناس العرب منهم والعجم فالحمد لله الذي لم يتخذ ولدا ولم يكن له شريك في الملك ولم يكن له ولي من الذل وكبره تكبيرا والحمد لله الذي أنزل على عبده الكتاب ولم يجعل له عوجا والحمد لله الذي نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونؤمن به ونتوكل عليه ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات أعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له ونشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له ونشهد أن محمدا عبده ورسوله أصله الله تعالى بالهدى ودين الحق ليظهره على الدين كله وكفى بالله شهيدا فصلى الله عليه وسلم تسليما كثيرا كثيرا أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وإن شر الأمور محدثاتها وإن كل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار قال الله عز وجل في كتابه الكريم بعد أن أقول أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم وأنكح الأيام منكم والصالحين من عبادكم وإمائكم إن يكونوا فقراء يغنهم الله من فضله والله واسع عليم وليستعفف الذين لا يجدون نكاحا حتى يغنيهم الله من فضله والذين يبتغون الكتاب مما ملكت إيمانكم فكاتبوهم إن علمتم فيهم خيرا وآتوهم من مال الله الذي آتاكم ولا تكره فتياتكم على البغاء إن أردنا تحصنا لتبتغوا عرض الحياة الدنيا ومن يكره هن فإن الله من بعد إكراه هن غفور رحيم ولقد أنزلنا إليكم آيات مبينات ومثلا من الذين خلوا من قبلكم وموعظة للمتقين رب شح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي واللهم ثبتنا عند الموت بلا إله إلا الله واللهم اجعلنا من الذين آمنوا وعملوا الصالحات وتواصوا بالحق وتواصوا بالصبر آمين يا رب العالمين In today's khutbah what I hope to discuss with you inshallah ta'ala is uh, one maybe two ayat of surah an-nur uh, the 24th surah of the Quran I've referred to this surah several times there are teachings in this surah that are fundamental for a community to survive and not lose Allah's guidance so places in the Quran Allah gives us instructions as an ummah other places in the Quran, Allah gives us guidance as an individual or as a family. And in some places in the Quran, He gives us guidance as a community. People that, that, families that support each other and live together. And how they need to help each other not fall off the path that Allah wants us to stay on. And so part of those instructions is what I'm going to talk to you about today. And before I do, uh, I'm going to share some observations. And then I'm going to read, you know, and, and try to extrapolate some of these lessons from these ayat. And I want you to see for yourself where you and I fall. You know, obviously, all of us belong to different cultures. Uh, we come from different countries. Many of us come from, you know, uh, parts of Asia, parts of Africa, parts of Europe, diff different parts of the world. And every place has its own traditions, its own cultures. Your family has your own way of doing things. Sometimes cultures are so different that people, the way they do things in one village is very different from the way people do things in the next village, right? And when people identify with a particular family or tribe or culture, then those values and those, the norms, from everything from the way we eat, from the way we dress, you know, from the way we speak, uh, all of those, th our ceremonies, celebrations, all of those things are very deeply impacted by the places we come from and the culture that we belong to, right? I mean, it's, of course it's different when we come to a place like the United States or when people move from different parts of the world to Europe or Australia or some parts of the West, where they keep parts of their culture, but they're now part of a new culture. And their children are being exposed to a different world. So inside the home is biryani culture, but outside is you know, hamburger culture. So it's completely different worlds. And they have to figure out how to live in both. 
You know, because the, the and, and sometimes when people come and move to a different country, they, they want to remember how things used to be back home, right? So even you find, for example, in the United States, there are many places in the, in the United States where the masajid, uh, the khutbah, is done in not English. It's actually done sometimes in Urdu or Bangla or Arabic or some other language. And even though the, the, every building neighboring that masjid is English speaking, the entire neighborhood is English speaking, it's America. But there are some people there that want to remember how things used to be back home. So we need to keep things inside here the way they used to be. Back, and I, I know masjids in New York that have been around for 50 years that still give khutbah in a local language nobody understands, except the elders. Even their own grandchildren don't understand. Because they, they've moved on and they've become more Americanized than their grandparents. Right? But it doesn't matter, That's that we're going to keep things as they used to be. The first thing I want to share with you is culture is a very powerful force. It's not an evil force, but it's a very powerful force. This is a habit, you know, human beings have habits that form over time. We're talking about habits that have formed inside of a family over generations. So it's not something small. And breaking away from that is not something easy. Allah does not give us, did not give us Islam to destroy culture or to get rid of culture. For some people, they have this wrong conception in their mind that Islam is against culture. That's absolutely incorrect. Allah Azza wa did not come to eliminate different cultures. In fact, what Allah gave us in His, in his teachings and what He gave us in the legacy of His Prophet وسلم, is a way to bring Allah's guidance to every culture. You can still dress how you like, eat how you like, you can still celebrate your festivities how you like, but here's the haram that you can remove from it. Here's the oppression that you can remove from it. Maybe some parts of our culture is oppressive. Maybe some parts of it is unfair. Maybe it wrongs people. So our religion came to remove parts of that culture that was wronging people and kept everything else. Just to give you a small example of even the time of the Prophet ﷺ, part of their culture was having a daughter was embarrassing. If a girl was born in your household, it was like a, wow, you're not man enough to have a, a son, you had a daughter, right? And the, when a person got news that they, a daughter was born in their household, they would get depressed. Walla wajhuhu muswaddan wa huwa kaleem. You know, Allah describes, it's like his face has a dark cloud overshadowing him and he's swallowing his frustration. And he's uh, avoiding eye contact with people. And that was an ignorant culture they used to have. Our Prophet ﷺ gave us an instruction, gave us this good news. Any of you that have three daughters and three, you know, three sisters or three sisters and are good to them, then Allah will guarantee them Jannah. And then somebody asked, how about two, how about one? And he kept bringing the number down. Allah will give you Jannah. Being, meaning having a daughter, having a sister is a ticket to heaven. He, he, he flipped that culture. He changed that culture, even though that didn't work for many Muslims. Even today, I remember when I had my second daughter, uh, I, went to the, I was so happy, I went to the masjid with a bunch of donuts. And I gave, it's a baby. And somebody asked me, some fellow, I'm not going to name the country, but pretty much all Muslim countries are the same now, right? They asked me, so what is it? Boy, right? I said, no, it's a girl. He goes, ah, oh, inshallah, next time. <laughs> you know? <laughs> right? Because it's not good news to have a daughter. What, what religion is this? This is exactly what our religion came to fix, but it's been 1400 years. And that, that idea that sons are better is before Islam. It's from before Islam. But even though Islam came, and Islam is a powerful force, for some people, they could not let go of parts of their culture that came from before Islam. And even though they became Muslim, that part, part, some parts of that culture that doesn't go with Islam remained. It stayed there, and it's still there, and it's carrying on. So you have our religion, and then you have parts of a culture that are completely opposite of our religion. And we have to decide which of these is a more powerful force, which has more authority. Sometimes our culture has nothing to go, there's nothing be wrong between our culture and Islam. The way I'm dressed right now purposely is part of it is part of the culture I belong to, from different parts of the culture I belong to. There's nothing extra Islamic about that or un-Islamic about that. Our Prophet وسلم, on special occasions, for example, he used to wear a turban. On special occasions, he used to wear a turban. But you know what? Abu Jahl also wore a turban on special occasions. You know what? Abu Lahab also wore a turban on special occasions. The wearing of a turban or dressing like the Arabs was not Islam. That already existed before the Prophet was even born. وسلم, but there's nothing wrong with it. It's completely fine. So the Prophet ﷺ keeps parts of the culture, there's nothing wrong with them. 
but there are other parts of the culture, there's something wrong with it that has to be eliminated. Now, with that in mind, that's not the subject of my khutbah. I've taken too long to, to bring you that introduction. Maybe this, this subject will take a few khutbahs to get, get across. But in any case, I wanted to just take one part of this culture. Around the world, as I travel or people write to me on social media, they email me, they talk to me, one common problem that many people bring up, many people bring up is, I can't get married. Men and women, I can't get married. And then you ask the simple question, why can't you get married? Well, my parents say I'm too young. Or my, my, you know, now if it's a girl, well, now I can't get married because culturally I'm too old, I'm past the expiration date. Or I, I did find someone I want to marry, but she's from a different ethnicity, or he's from a different ethnicity, my parents won't accept it. Or they, you know, they're, they're not from the same economic class. It could be from, they're, they're from the same country. They're from the same country. They speak the same language. But unfortunately, they belong to the village next one, one ten miles over. No, not those people. We can't, we can't have our family be contaminated by those people. Okay, so it needs to be from within our own proximity. Or my parents decided a long time ago who I'm going to marry, even though I don't want to marry them. But now they're like telling me that I don't have a choice. These are just some, or you know, I'm divorced, and now nobody wants to, because you know, d divorced is worse than like you know, is worse than like the coronavirus. You don't want to go near people that are divorced because you, your kids might catch that virus. Don't even invite them to Eid gatherings because, you know, because they're, they're, they're contaminated people, you know. And so we, we've created these values, these standards, or sometimes, you, you know, a young man or woman comes and says, I'm ready to get married. Some, a family's willing to marry, but my parents said, you have an older brother, you have an older sister, or you have older siblings. They're not married yet. Until they're married, you need to sit, sit tight, relax. Now these guidelines, these rules that we have in our families, in our cultures, none of these have to do anything with Islam. But what does Allah say about getting, allowing people to get married when they want to get married? And who they want to get married to? Allah gave us guidelines of who you can marry. And as parents, we have opinion. I want to start off very quickly with the only marriages mentioned in the Quran, or at least one I want to highlight to you in the Quran. Musa alayhi salam accidentally killed someone. You people know this. He ran away from Egypt. The entire military and the cops were looking for him. And if they found him, they would have killed him on the spot. He ran off into the desert. He found a couple of young women. He helped them. He was de dehydrated, almost dead, but he helped them anyway. And when he helped them, he sat back down under the tree. Now these women used to work in a non-Muslim society. All the men around them were perverts. And they noticed this man helped us, and he didn't even stare at us. He wasn't indecent towards us. So they, when they went back to their dad, they told him we met a really good man. He said, call him over. So the, then she, they came back and they called him. One of them came back and called him over. And he told his entire story to the father. He was now in Madian. Musa alayhi salam is from the children of Israel. Okay, so he's, he's an Israelite. And he was in Madian, which is Arab land. He's in Arab land. So he's in, this is an Israelite talking to the Arab. And he tells the Arab father, yeah, I used to live in Egypt, and I killed someone, and I'm a fugitive from the law, and I'm homeless right now, and this is my story. So here's the, here's the list. I killed somebody, I'm homeless, and I don't know where to, I don't have no food to eat. And the dad listens to him and says, I think I should marry one of my daughters to you. How about, how about you marry one of my girls? You can live here for 10 years. Eight years is 10 if you want. And he said, hold on, I don't think that my mom would be okay with that. Let me check with her first. Let me just see if I can get in touch with her, no, he just, yeah, sure, sign me up, good deal, you know, this is between you and me, it was completely fine, Allah taught us something, first of all, was it a marriage inside the ethnicity, no, was it a marriage where the son was ready, financially capable, with an impressive resume before he got married, no, no, as a matter of fact, the resume didn't even include, by the way, I'm a prophet of Allah, no, because that happened on the mountain many years later. He wasn't even a prophet yet. So the only thing on a resume is that I'm honest, and I'm a good person, and I don't have a place to go. That's all he had on his resume. And Allah describes how he got married. That's, that's Musa alayhi salam. And you know, culturally, by the way, culturally, it's really bad if you live with your in-laws, isn't it? If a man lives with his mother-in-law or father-in-law, it's like, what kind of man are you, man? And 10 years, Musa alayhi salam lived with his father-in-law. 10 years. You, anybody want to challenge his manhood? 
that you're not mad enough to live, what, you can't live on your own? What's wrong with you? You know? But we don't think like that. Now, that's not even my subject. Let's start the subject that the ayah I wanted to discuss with you. Well, and listen to this carefully. These are Allah's words. And Allah's words are above my culture and yours. They're above my family's expectations and yours. These are Allah's words who knows better for us than we know for ourselves. He says to us as a community, وَأَنْكِحُ الْأَيَامَ مِنْكُمْ Get the unmarried among you married. Get the single people in your community married. Uh, this means allow them to get married. It all, meaning don't put, bar don't put barriers in their place. Allah makes something halal. You and I don't get to make it haram. You and I don't get to say, no, no, not yet. If Allah has no problem with it, then you and I don't get to have a problem with it. You don't, have to, don't, don't get to say, no, 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 finish your master's degree, and then your PhD, and then by then become deeply depressed because you're alone and lonely, and then we'll see because by that time you'll have psychological issues, and then we'll get you married to somebody so you can give them psychological issues. <laughs> okay, let's do that. No, 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 how about you stay in a university where you have to, you're, you have to constantly guard your eyes from looking at haram, and there are the, the opposite genders constantly coming at you all the time, and you're just a human being, you're going to be thrown in that temptation. But you know what? You're a good boy. So you stay in that environment for six, seven, eight, ten years, and then when you've saved enough, and you've bought a house, and you've bought us one also, because you're also our bank, then when we're done withdrawing enough from this bank, then you can go and get married, because we don't want some girl coming into your life and taking all the money we were hoping for. We put a lot of money into you. We need to get a refund first. We can't just let you get married. What is that? What's the matter? Can't control yourself? And you're completely fine. Some families are completely fine if their sons or daughters are doing whatever because they that's not a problem. It's okay. They're just young. But marriage, no. Haram is okay. Halal, no good. I've even heard parents say, I have no problem if you want to have a girlfriend or boyfriend, but this marriage business, you better stop. Really? So it's, I'm per, let me translate that for you. I'm perfectly okay if you disobey Allah, but this doing the halal thing, I, our culture is more important than that. How dare we say the word of Allah is the highest when we can't even allow peop, any slave of Allah that when something is halal for them, that includes our children, we don't own our children. They are an amana to us given from Allah. They're an amana to us given from Allah. And when they are asking for the right option. If, and that's not if they're children. You, I'm not telling you your 13-year-old says, oh, I heard a khutbah from Ustad Uman, and I think I'm ready. No, I'm not talking about that. I'm not talking, Those of you that are capable, if you're making your own income, if you're independent now, if you're, if you're at a certain point of maturity and you're ready, if, and, and that's not decided by your parents. Because sometimes your parents, you could be 40 years old and just say you're not ready. You're not ready. Or, you know, you, you can't like that one. We want you to like that one. You don't decide that. You don't decide that for someone. If they have made a decision and they want to marry somebody, then if it's, if it's within the halal, then we shouldn't put barriers in its place. And so, it, sometimes it's ethnicity. Sometimes it's their financial status. No, you're a doctor. You can only marry a doctor. Or this one's too old or this one's too young. Or your, you know, your older siblings. Or, you know, what about, you need to get to a certain place financially. No, listen to the rest of this ayah. This is remarkable. This was in Medina, right? And Medina was not a rich place. So when we think about marriage nowadays, we think about booking a hall, catering, inviting people over from different parts of the continent. Because if they don't come and dance at the wedding, then how is it even halal? Right? So then we have to, we have to do all of these thousands of dollars of expenses and you know, exorbitant amounts of you know, uh, unnecessary expense. And it has to be a big deal because everybody has to watch it. Of course, if you're not putting it on display for the world, then did it even happen? You know, if you, if you didn't make a, a, a scene out of it, then did it even occur? So all of these cultural expectations that put the young man and woman in financial debt and their families in financial <laughs> debt before they even start their life. But that's our standard. That's, we have to do that because they did it, and they did it, and they did it, and they did it. And you know, Medina was a bankrupt place. It was a very poor place, you know. Allah says the, the, the Ansar, first of all, the Muhajirun were homeless anyway, right? They left Mecca. They don't have a home. And the ones who gave them a home, the Ansar, what does Allah say about them? يُؤْثِرُونَ عَلَىٰ أَنفُسِهِمْ وَلَوْ كَانَ بِهِمْ خَصْحَاصًا They give others preference over themselves even though they're dying of hunger. Meaning the sponsors are dying of hunger. <laughs> Not the refugees. The sponsors don't have enough food. 
That was Medina. And then Allah says, listen to this. وَالصَّالِحِينَ مِنْ عِبَادِكُمْ وَإِمَائِكُمْ Get your, get your unmarried, whether they're young or old, divorced, you know, they, they want to get married. Give them the space to get married. Allow them, enable them, encourage them, help them to get married. And then take the good among your slaves, men and women. Meaning slave is the, you know, slavery existed at the time. And these servants were the lowest economic ebb of society. They don't have a home to their name. They don't have a property to their name. They have nothing. And Allah says, even they should not go unmarried. Even they should not go unmarried. Meaning Quran is teaching us your financial situation, though it is important, if you create a culture where unless you are financially in a certain place, only then you can get married. When you create that, you are closing the door to halal, and you're closing the door to halal and opening the door to haram wide open. Wide open. And you know, you have to remember, for shaitan, when he got to our parents in Jannah, every tree was halal. And only one tree was haram. And he was able to enough whisper to them to go to that one tree that was haram, right? And what are Muslims doing? Muslims are not going after that one tree that's haram. Muslims are creating for themselves every tree that's haram. And no... <laughs> Every tree that's haram, we're opening up, and the trees that are halal, we're chopping them down. For our own children, for, for our own kids. This is not okay for us to do. This is a form of oppression. This is, a, this is creating chaos in society. Even if slaves were told in the Quran, get, get, allow them to get married. And then Allah says, okay, well how can they, people would ask, how can slaves afford it? How are they even going to afford to get married? Allah says, these are Allah's words, not mine. If they are bankrupt, Allah will give them from His own favor. Meaning this is more important than even money. Getting them married is even more important than money. And then He says, Allah is vast. Allah knows. He knows what He's talking about. He knows what He's talking about more than you and me. So when He says this is the right course of action, then He knows, he knows finances better than you and me. He knows psychology better than you and me. He knows sociology better than you and me. He knows the short term and the long term better than you and me when he gave this recommendation. In the next ayah, those who are not able to find somebody to marry should try to hold themselves back as much as possible until Allah gives them the ability to do so. If they impossibly can't find, the problem is not, that's not what I'm saying to you. If you can't find, be patient. Everybody knows that already. But the, the reality of it is so many of our young men and women and older, young, uh, older men and women that are ready to get married, that, that can get married, that have a halal option to get married, their doors are being closed. And unfortunately, they're being closed by Muslims, not non-Muslims. And that is really a big, a big crisis of violating what Allah says in these ayat. This is what Allah says in these ayat. By the way, this ayah, right before it, as I conclude now, right before it, is the ayah of women should guard their eyes and cover themselves and men should guard their eyes. Right before it. So first Allah says guard yourselves. And then even Allah says you can't guard yourselves forever. Every desire Allah put inside the human being, He gave them a halal road. So He says guard yourselves as much as possible, but really your final security is going to be what? Marriage itself. Let people get married. Let young people get married. Let the older elder get married. Let pe women get remarried. It's okay. This, this was the culture of the Sahaba. Medina, you, you would think, you know, and, and I talked about the financial realities of Medina. It wasn't just the financial realities. When you study the life in Medina before the Prophet moved there, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, and even after he moved there carefully, you find Medina had prostitution, Medina had open zina, Medina had, was a crazy place. Quran came to clean up a pretty wild town. It was the Vegas of the time. It was not some normal town. I mean, you study the, the historical context of the city of Medina and its culture, you'll be shocked. And Quran came to clean that up too. And the Sahaba didn't know better, and this is why the Sahaba were being given these instructions. You know? And if you can't find someone, and you want, you, you, you know, and Allah even talked about those who can't afford to get married. What does He say to the community? He says, Give them from the money Allah has given you, from Allah's money that He gave you. He doesn't say give them from your money. He says give them from Allah's money that He gave you so they can get married. So they can get married. This is Allah's call. Allah says His own wealth that He gave you is best used helping people get married. That's what it's best used for. 
وَلَا تُكْرِهُ فَتَيَاتِكُمْ عَلَى الْبِغَارِ And don't force your young women into prostitution. That's what he says then. And bigat means rebellion also. And even though there was a you know, prostitution problem back then, there's another problem now. We are forcing our young men and women into sin. You, are, you and I know what social media is like. You and I know what Snapchat and Instagram and We know what that's like. You know what temptation's like. It's bombarding our youth in every single direction. And if there's one thing we want to, if we want to live this life and walk out of it and meet with Allah successful, then we have to preserve the light Allah put inside of us. And the best way to destroy that light is to let go of the haya of a human being. And it's being attacked every single day. Anybody who has a mobile device, it's being attacked. That's the reality. If you have a mobile device and it's connected to the internet, well, shaitan's constantly got a hold on you. You can have a Quran app on there, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. You can have Islamic YouTube videos, doesn't matter. The shaitan's in there too. The sh it, it's an extension of ourselves and it's made temptation easier to follow. That's the reality of it. And in that environment, when you close the door to the halal or you make it difficult, then the haram is only one or two taps of a finger away, isn't it? That's, that's a harsh reality. And so what? We should, people should be stronger. If Allah just said people should be stronger and they should wait, he, he would have said that. He knows who He created. He gave these instructions, not you and me. We don't have to consider ourselves stronger or consider ourselves more righteous than Allah made us. La tuzakku anfusakum huwa a'lamu biman ittaqa. Don't declare yourself self-righteous. Don't declare yourself so pure. He knows better who has taqwa or not. He knows our weaknesses. He spoke to us. He gave us these guidance, guidelines knowing our weaknesses. Knowing our weaknesses. That's the key to understanding these ayat is to first of all acknowledge that we are not above them. That Allah's word is above our own personal pride. It's above our family. It's above our culture. It's above our preferences. First and foremost, we don't want to allow anybody to fall into sin. In another khutbah, inshallah, I'll talk about maturity. What, let's, let's dig further into this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ when he says, those of you that are capable. Because I don't want these words to be misused by, well, you know, there's a... I watched this video, and now let me get married. <laughs> well, are you capable? Are you? Because the Prophet said, whoever among you is capable, فَلْيَتْ has a wedge. Then they should get married. So what is that ba'a? And what is that, that term that the Prophet used, alayhi salatu wasalam? And how does the Qur'an refer to that term? What are those qualities that we have to have? Maybe that conversation will happen, inshallah ta'ala, next week. Barakallahu li wa lakum fil Qur'an al-Hakim wa nafa'ni wa iyaakum bil ayati wa al-Hakim May Allah Azza wa Jal protect us and our children and our community from any form of fitna and allow us to follow the path of halal and close the doors to the haram.